some people never grasp in their entire existence how important it is to be proud of where you live and be happy where you live. They don't get a sense of the soul of their town. And they don't realize how important it is to recognize your treasures and take care of them. It's just a matter of uh, recognizing what's important to you. And um, if you have to fight to save it, then do it. This was a thriving downtown. All the chains were here, Pennies and Sears and Woolworths. I mean, everything was here. So what went wrong? Apache and Navajo County have the lowest income of any counties in the state. Holbrook and Winslow, we don't have a real industrial base. We had a mill out here that one time employed here and in the woods about 200 people. Now the mill is gone and so we've lost you know all 200 or, or more of the employees. Business for the most part is started on borrowed money and when you startup costs are very expensive. It's hard to sell a dream especially to a banker. I mean you have a dream and, and, and you, you've you know bankers deal with facts and figures. By law, banks are required to invest a certain percentage of their portfolio locally to reinvest and, and promote the local economy. People tell me they are having trouble getting banks to buy their dream and, and uh, so I guess that's the best way to put it. I think one thing that happened in Windsor was a disinvestment by the city fathers. So there were people in town who have a lot of money, um, but they stopped investing in the town. What we have to do is take that disposable income and put it back into the community um, and have those people buy buildings and fix them up. I came out in uh, 90, 94, um, and the reason I came out here is that the guy that owned this building said, you can live in it free for a year and we'll work out a lease option. He said, sold, that was it, because I was, I was graduating out of fine arts at UCI, uh, and uh, to actually get a studio space in LA was you know, I'd be working 60 hours a week, you know, so I could go and sleep in my studio. I'd never be able to get any work done. So uh, when I saw this space, I said, I'll make it work somehow. And that was it. I was here. What kept occurring to me over and over again was the thought that there was a definite possibility that uh, at some point in time, we could look up and up the street and see a dead space where La Posada now is. We could see dead trees. We would be able to uh, see boarded up, a boarded up building with graffiti on it. We would see dead grass. This is the beginning of the end uh, when, when a town uh, can actually be faced with losing its most beautiful resource and its most beautiful architecture and its most beautiful grounds simply because we didn't act uh, Winslow's always looked outside itself for uh, we're going to we're going to discover oil there's going to be a gold mine there's all my life there's been this miracle that's going to happen and suddenly in my talks I presented the fact that uh, the princess was asleep and the princess is us did it ever occur to you that we are also the handsome prince that is to kiss her and awaken her we got the word out um, as far as we could that this was a national treasure we were dealing with. Uh, it's not just an ordinary hotel. This was not just an, uh, an ordinary depot. This, this is Mary Coulter's masterpiece, and it is a marvel of architecture and beauty. Now, I graduated from high school in the 60s, so I am aware of efforts that were made to do a lot of things to better Winslow, beginning in the 50s, then again in the 60s, then again in the 70s, and then the 80s. And it just finally got to the point where I think the people of the town itself um, didn't really believe that anybody who came along and said, we're going to do this, believed they would do it. If your downtown is a ghost town, nobody wants to come there. And in 94, we were right at our, uh, the low part of the curve of recovery. I've been here six years, the first three years. Um, I saw Kmart close, Factory to You, Radio Shack. Hallmark move and you know more buildings go vacant 
uh, and you, it's hard to imagine more buildings going vacant. So uh, in the next three years, uh, um, not long after La Posada got in, I started to see more and more people uh, moving into the buildings. And again, half of these businesses may not make it, but at least someone's in the building. It used to be just me and the police department at 5 o'clock, which I kind of liked. But you know, now I have neighbors throughout, and that's, that's the start of it. Forty years for this town to decline. That's the way it worked. And it's not going to come back in two years or three years. But people are beginning to think that their real estate down here has, has value. So you hope they don't sit on it or put too high a price on it so that they squelch your downtown development. You know, or that they sit on it and then don't repair the roof when it leaks and end up with a trashed building. If we had any hope of any kind of pride again in our community, this was to be the cornerstone and this was to, to set an example to the people of Winslow that there are things that can be accomplished if you stay with it. And this was where so many people uh, were, were full of doubts. We were able to, by a divine act of God, I swear, to, um, to meet with the Western Regional Director of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Elizabeth Henning. She was at a seminar that I attended and I told her about La Posada. And I just begged her to um, either give me some advice or, or, or direction or, or else come see the place. She said, I'll just take the train. I'll, I'll go down to L.A. and I'll get on Amtrak. And I'll come to Winslow and uh, I'll get off the train right there at La Posada and I'll just check it out. She was responsible for getting uh, La Posada listed um, on the 1993 list of, m of most endangered buildings throughout the United States. During all this time, Janice put an ad in our little uh, penny saver uh, publication called The Reminder. said, if you love La Posada, bring your, your work gloves, rakes, hoses, trash uh, bags, and lawnmowers and meet at La Posada. And we met with them the first time in July of 93, and I think we had two dozen. and. Uh, Two weeks later, we added another two dozen, and uh, the the group was dubbed the Gardening Angels because this was all volunteer work. Over the period of four years, we had over 6,500 hours of volunteer labor contributed. Even though within the city uh, father's thinking, there was not a great deal of hope given this project, we found that this community loved it and they came and they supported it and then that in turn was motivation for us to continue to be the problem solvers and uh, that stood me through the trying times. We put together what we thought would be a good plan but alas no money and the bills were large. There was a historical analysis on this building and with this building came a three million dollar restoration bill. And so it was very frustrating for about six months. And bless Arizona's heart, they were a little slow in coming out of the starting gate on Intermodal Surface Transportation Enhancement Act funding. And that put us in the right place at the right time. And so we applied for it. And 64 days later, uh, Winslow's La Posada had traveled from being first in the district, NACOG district, uh, to third on the uh, first round of funding for um, use of iced tea money. And so I like to say we brought home $500,000 and laid it on the table and it got us in the poker game. The uh, city passed the option to purchase and the $500,000 to this stranger that we did not know. His name was Alan Affelt and he came from California. Mm -hmm. And so even though my heart skipped a beat because he was an unknown quantity, uh, we had said a prayer many times that, that by the grace of God and the spirit of Mary Coulter, this would happen, and we felt the presence of both. We didn't intend to buy La Posada and fix it up. We just wanted to look at it. I always, I love architecture and want to look at it. It's a fabulous building, uh, but we had no intention of buying it. I was running an architectural think tank in Laguna Beach called the EOS Institute which was composed of a bunch of eco-architects and designers, really great people. Um, and uh, they produced a nice magazine and they did eco-architecture, straw bale houses, rammed earth, that sort of thing. And I was interested in, in building interesting eco-friendly spaces and, um, and also in architecture as an art form. And that's one thing about this building. 
It's a passive solar building. Um, passive solar building, enormous thermal mass. It's designed to work with the local patterns of wind. Uh, there's wind towers in the building. It's just a great functional building from an engineering point of view. Um, so I, I had been a member of the National Trust for Historic Preservation because I loved architecture as art. And this building just showed up in 1993. It was close enough that we could come and look at it. I fell in love with it before I came. We read this little thing in the news, uh, the magazine, and he is always coming up to me with bizarre ideas. Well, let's buy this. Let's, oh, there's a hot spring, so let's get this. And I would either give my initial gut reaction of yes or no. And I rarely gave my gut reaction of yes. And we called up about this place. When we got the fax machine about La Posada, and I took my first look at the building, I said yes. I loved the building. I really felt at peace here. We slept when it was empty, so I could get a feel for it at night. And um, that's how I give my final feeling. What happens when we start something like this, or the Peace Walks, or the concerts, or the films, or anything else? The general attitude is it can't be done. This is a huge building. You can't pay for it. It'll never support itself. The downtown is abandoned. So how much was the grant for? Uh, $500,000. But the problem wasn't just the grant. The problem was, OK, so we were awarded the grant. We had to come up with the match, but we didn't own the building. So we had to buy the building from the railroad. And the grant was complicated, too, because you can't use federal money on a building until you have an environmental clearance, which means the environmental mitigation had to be complete before we could get any grant money. But we needed grant money to buy the building before we could start the mitigation. So we had this chicken and the egg problem. And then when we did the environmental tests, they found that there had been a roundhouse on the west end of the property at the turn of the century. And bedrock is only down about 15 feet, which is the basement floor. And consequently, there was some oil sediment contamination under the building. Only way to get rid of it, we were told, was to knock the building down, excavate the basement, get the oil out, and then we could use the federal grant money to buy the building. So it was kind of a perverse problem. The railroad and the state and the federal government and the city have all been really wonderful. For example, we got the federal government to agree to a mitigation plan which was a passive plan which enabled us to pump steam under high pressure through the subflooring to clear out the, uh, the oil. We got the railroad to agree to pay for that and for the federal government to give us money to buy the building. And we agreed to give the railroad office space rent free. So the railroad took care of their environmental mitigation problem. We used the money for the match. Or they sold the building to us for the land value they wrote off the value of the building as a tax donation. Um, so we only had to use a relatively small amount of money to buy the building. The railroad paid for the mitigation, and we could use the rest of our initial contribution, which was a few hundred thousand dollars, to buy the building and start doing the restoration with the grant money. So it was fairly complicated, and there were a lot of pieces that had to come together. And it did take about three years. Um, but when all was said and done, everybody won. The city won because they got an outside capital investment in their community, and they got some new jobs created. We've had incredible media, um, so the town has gotten more positive PR than it's had in its entire history. The railroad has free office space. Everybody's happy. In my opinion, a lot of it is serendipity. There's, there's great art, and there's good timing, and sometimes they come together, and sometimes they don't. And uh, this building is here because they came together. If it would have been some architect other than Coulter, the building probably wouldn't still be here because it would have torn it down. Um, if it would have been some other town like Phoenix, they would have torn it down because the land value would have exceeded the building value. You've got to be in the right place at the right time with the right energy, but a lot of it's just good fortune. Um, and a lot of it is, it's like a garden, you know, it's an act of faith. You plant a tree, Maybe it's going to be there 20 years from now. Um, you build a building, maybe it's going to be there 20 years from now. We're really lucky that the railroad converted to offices in a way. The railroad needed office space. They had this big, huge building. They figured, what the heck, we'll just tear out some walls and make it into offices. And, you know, I think it was good fortune that we came along when we did, because the railroad did want to abandon the building. 
Maybe somebody else would have come along, maybe not. When we started, uh, none of us were hotel developers. The one common trait um, is that we were all doers. So uh, by hook or by crook, we would always find a way. You know, uh, I'm a guy that can do all sorts of things on car repair because I've never been rich enough to just take it to a mechanic and do it. And so I figure out how to do it. And uh, when we first started with La Posada, you know, we, we met with architects and they had their analyst, hotel analysts, come out and give us a list of things that we needed to do. And, at first, I think we were really, you know, kind of almost taken in by that. And then after sitting there a while and actually realizing, you know, the, the start of the whole project was demolition and swinging that sledgehammer and then going from there and realizing, well, yeah, I can yank all the electrical out. Well, you know what, it's real easy to stick in a lamp after that. You start to grow more and more confident. So this is a completely reconstructed space. This is exactly as Coulter laid it out. But it's pretty amazing because none of this formwork existed a month ago. The, the railroad, though, tore all out. Tore it all out. Okay. Tore it all out. In the foyer there, there were beautiful flagstone floors. And there were big sections of it where they just covered it all with vinyl because it was more office-like. And there are other sections where they actually went to the trouble and expense of jackhammering out the stone so they could pour concrete in its place and then put vinyl over the concrete. Now, how do you explain that? You can't. Um, there's no economic excuse for it, there's no aesthetic excuse for it, there's not even a functional justification for it. We're lucky because they had a use for it, it was always maintained. The infrastructure was upgraded, um, no broken windows, no vandals, it was structurally perfect. And that's very rare in a building like this. So we're really lucky that the railroad converted offices in a way because if they hadn't done that, the building would have been torn down. So they did mangle it aesthetically, but it's still here and it's a relatively straightforward reconstruction. There was a sense of sadness um, that this was such a magnificent place that really had been allowed to deteriorate so much that people didn't even know what it was anymore. Architecture, unlike a, unlike a painting or something which hangs in a building, architecture, if it's not cared for, deteriorates. Um, and the context was gone. I mean, the context of the town, this bustling town all around it, all the people in it, uh, it's, not a, it's not a static art. Architecture has a function. It's supposed to be a space for people to interact in. It's not strictly sculpture. Um, and so the entire context, the people context, the landscape context, the streetscape context, it was all gone. And then the interior artfulness of it also was significantly damaged. So I think there was a sense of how sad that this building, this incredible place, could have come so low and that there were people here who still remembered what it was. And to them, it was really lost forever because although they wanted it to be restored, I didn't really get the sense for many of them that they believed it was possible. This building survives because we've been very fortunate in getting state support, federal support, and because we're willing to work for nothing. And because we have some very, um, very wealthy, understanding partners who want to make it go. That's a very lucky and unusual set of circumstances. And if any of those elements were to change, it would be gone. Different grants have different requirements, but most grants are matching grants. And some grants are reimbursement grants. For example, the grants, the main grant we're using on the hotel is an iced tea grant, and that's a reimbursement grant, which means you spend the money first and then they reimburse a percentage of it. What we have to do is we spend a couple hundred thousand dollars and get it back, and then spend it again and get it back, and spend it again and get it back. What that means is we just spread out the construction schedule over six months instead of over two months. So you can do it, you just have to be kind of creative in your construction. It makes things a lot more difficult. But on the other hand, if you didn't have the grant money, these things would never be possible. 
because a commercial developer is not going to come into this building and say, sir, it's worth a $5 million investment to fix it up. This is a particularly magical space because the artist who created it originally had that extraordinary attention to detail. Everything here she thought through. I mean, this, this isn't a typical building by any matter of means. There's a hundred years of architectural detailing here. And it's, it's evident to me, looking at it through architectural eyes, how much love she put into the space. I mean, this was her art. And um, we're trying to do the same thing in our restoration of the building. And um, uh, most people get it, some people don't. Some people come and they say, you know, what's that weird modern art doing on the walls? And um, what is it with this place? And other people, I mean, they come and they get it instantly and they know it's something very special. This will be the main dining room. It's going to be called the turquoise room. Um, thus, turquoise ceiling. In fact, this color up on the ceiling is called Coulter Blue because that was Coulter's favorite color of turquoise. Um, so this was one of the six dining rooms in the original hotel, and this will be the main dining room. Looking down the hall will be gift shops. That'll be the main hall. It will always be open just as a transition to the foyer. On the right is the bar we're putting in a the Martini Lounge, which will be evocative of 1950s Streamline Modern train. We received a three quarter of a million uh, T21 grant, federal grant, and then a heritage grant for about 100,000. Uh, when we received the grant, it was for use in public space, go. for public space only, which means that uh, I couldn't use it in any of the guest rooms. In terms of actual, the projects that we had in the hotel, that restaurant in that little corner of the building, that was the toughest nut to crack. There are no really good restaurants in northeastern Arizona. That's not to take anything away from restaurants that are here. There are some good restaurants. But in terms of really first class service and food, it isn't here. Um, even Flagstaff is pretty thin. And of course, there's no architectural space like this anywhere around, except uh, El Tavar at the Grand Canyon, which has a wonderful dining room. Um, we didn't know how we would do it. So from the time we moved here, I've been courting a friend of mine named John Sharp, who had a half a dozen really first-class restaurants in Los Angeles and Orange County. I think we met Alan Tiener about 1992, something like that, 91, 92, I can't remember. Uh, Patricia, my wife, was taking art classes from Tina. That's how we met, and uh, then we became friends. I, I guess the Kind of one of the most interesting parts of all of that, in October of 1995, my wife organized a surprise 50th birthday party for me. So we had a big party and uh, Al and Tina gave me the Fred Harvey cookbook at that party, which I still have, and uh, you know, inscribed, you know, happy 50th, October 30th, 1995 never thinking in my wildest dreams it would ever evolve into me ending up running a former Harvey house. But, um, you know, Alan had uh, mentioned to me that he was going to do this project and hopefully would get this hotel and, you know, would I some point come and look at it and think about, you know, whether he could do a restaurant here. So uh, that was 1995. Um, January of 2000, I gave him a call which had to do with uh, having sold the restaurant group to someone else, to my ex-partner, and uh, we were going to take a year off and basically do nothing, uh, try and relocate out of Orange County. We knew we wanted, we knew we wanted to leave and go somewhere else, we weren't quite sure what we wanted to do. Uh, we weren't looking to come here, that wasn't the plan, just called him to say, well, you know, how are you doing, what's going on with where you are, and this is what's happening with us. I designed the kitchen and the restaurant, yeah, with Greg Kish, with the architect. At that time, we had no intention of running the restaurant or staying here or being here. So that was done, and Alan said, well, 
that's great, but who's going to run the restaurant? And I said, well, I don't know, that's your problem. You know, I'm going back to Orange County and, uh, and see what we're going to do. And he said, well, you know, what would it take to get you two to come up here? I thought it had a really good chance of working because I couldn't get over the fact that um, there were so many visitors to this area and there was nowhere to eat. And that was the startling thing to me. That's what really drove me to saying, you know, we should probably give this a whirl because where are these people eating? That was uh, January of 2000. And uh, to put it into a time perspective, we came here January 20th of 2000. Uh, we opened the restaurant October 10th of 2000. None of us are hoteliers. Uh, I like to do architecture. Dan, the general manager, is a sculptor, and my wife is a painter. A major motivation for buying the space was as a space for art, and it satisfied all three of us. This, this created our own little art fantasy world. Where are you going to get a house with 70,000 square feet of beautiful wall space to hang your work and have people come in and see it? I mean, it's the best art gallery I know of. So that's really satisfying for us, and that's a lot of our motivation here, is the artfulness of the space. Tina's brother, Keith, is a master carpenter, and he's gonna be doing a tremendous amount of carpentry for us, building the bar, building the newsstand, building all these radiator grills. So there's all that handmade stuff, all the tin work, like the Madonna in the entry hall and the chandeliers, those are all done by uh, Vern and Christy Lucero, master tinsmiths. Some of it's just mundane infrastructure stuff, but even infrastructure can be approached in a really creative fashion. You can just throw in an HVAC system or you can think about how to heat and cool the space in the least obtrusive way. And there's an art to that. It's engineering art. So what we try to do is whenever we bring tradespeople in, we tour them around the building, we let them stay here for free if they want to stay here, and we try to get them into the whole ethos of what we're trying to do here. <coughs> so each tradesperson approaches their trade in the most artful way possible. Yes. We didn't do so, this project because we wanted to do a hotel. Right, right. It could know, have been, right. if this was a monastery, we'd be doing a monastery. If this were um, a, so, yacht, a big, you know, ocean liner, we'd be doing an ocean liner. It's not because we wanted to do a right, hotel at all. Right. It just happened to be a hotel. But the building itself is, is an entity, and it was this entity that drew, drew us here. Tina and Dan think of themselves, the two of them really is, is artists, and the doing of the hotel is sort of peripheral. Whereas for me, I'm so engrossed in the hotel that my art is much more peripheral. I do the drawing and the architecture when I can, and I do the business and the politics and all that, because I have to, because it supports the whole art space for everyone else. And if, if, if we get to the point where we're working too much running the hotel, Tina has a fit, and we'll just go into her studio and won't come out. Dan will get really cranky unless he can get into his studio. And I, I suppose I'm the same way, although I don't see it in myself. Um, but we gotta be doing that or we're just not happy. And that's the justification for us. I'm really interested in plywood right now. And what fascinates me uh, about the material is uh, this edge iron view that you get and the, the striping that you get, uh, plus the texture you can work out of plywood. I mean, it's very rough rugged. Uh, I'm buying the cheapest grade CDX plywood, which means that when I go to sand it and cut it, it splinters, cracks, and breaks. And it also has lots of gaps and holes in it, which to me, that texture is valuable. If it was some person trying to do a finished piece of furniture, they'd be miserable right now. Right. Uh, and probably initially when I started to work on a lot of sculptures, you know, that misery was part of my, my problem too, because I couldn't, I didn't at first get by the fact that uh, it's okay for something to disintegrate or, or uh, become uneven. So uh, the odd thing about a lot of the pieces I make is that they're very much based on repetition and perhaps a sense of perfection. I mean, uh, to look at this, you can see that everything's pretty much lined up. There's a very nice grid pattern with a nice wave to it. Um, however, it's, it's also filled with imperfection. And as you're going through all this, it's kind of like a mantra or doing a rosary or uh, anything else that's repetitive, you tend to think a lot. And so whereas I may have had uh, a very distinct idea of what I wanted to do when I started, I've realized now that there's a couple of other ideas. When I first started making sculpture, that bothered the heck out of me. And now it, it doesn't bother me nearly so much. Matter of fact, I, I feel like I'm failing if I don't have that much change going on. 
I always loved the mixing of things. Um, I guess as being a little boy, I like to mix stuff. But I think what happened when I look back on it, um, it all had to do with that basic uh, need that we all have to be appreciated. And what I did was always appreciated. I love to cook and I like to sit down and eat and people like to eat my food and they told me so. So, you know, it was that positive reinforcement thing and that started out as a kid and, and never stopped. I mean, that's one of the great things about doing what we do in the restaurant business. You know, you, you create a product, you put it out there, it goes on the table and hopefully people like it right away and if they do, you know. You know, it's not like manufacturing a video camera. <laughs> you know, and you make a camera and then people buy it and then, well, then what do you do? You gotta manufacture another video camera. You know, but you don't, you don't have everybody that uses the video camera telling you, God, John, you designed a great video camera. So that's what it's all about. It's all about positive reinforcement and appreciation. Being here affects my artwork too. Oh, it completely changed it. And, and it's very important to me because I'd just gotten done having this big show in Los Angeles. And I'd worked for a couple of years on it. After it was done, it was so stressful getting ready for it. And after it was done, I went off to Africa for six weeks. And Alan stayed in the United States and tried to buy this building. And I had no idea whether he was going to buy the La Posada or not. And I got, we were only able, I was out on safari, so we were only able to have contact once while I was gone, and he still hadn't known. So it wasn't until I got off the plane at LAX that he told me that, um, he meet, greeted me and told me that he had bought La Posada and that we were leaving the next morning to Winslow on the train. Oh, immediately. So it was, um, and I had had a sense that I might be here for a while and not have the freedom to travel. So when I moved here, I'd gotten a lot of traveling out of my system and then it was the move and then I started a whole new show and a whole new, my paintings got a lot larger and it was really nice because it was starting something new and I'll, I'll be finished next year. And then I'll do something dramatic before I start the next project. So how, how, what I was wondering, what's the hardest thing about getting a project done? It sounds like it is hard to get to the end. Oh, know, an so. art project? Or this project? You know, it's interesting since they both started simultaneously. And they're both kind of, and we're gonna be almost done the main part of it simultaneously. And I've been involved in both from the very beginning. So it's very interesting how they've gone on together. And they're both historical, and they both take historical research. But as far as the hardest part for my own personal project, I don't know. I don't know, it's just you gotta keep up the momentum. What's the been the hardest part about this project? It's really hmm. For me, it's been so much contact with so many people. That's been the hardest part. Because I'm, I'm not used to this much contact with other humans, and so much, and all the time. Do you see an end to this project? Of course, of course there's an end to all projects, but the building will keep going on. Mm -hmm. We'll pass through it, we'll die, and the building will still remain here. But we will be part of its history. We will always be part of its history now. We definitely left our mark on this place. Right. And we've left our spirits here, a part of our spirits are here forever. What, what's the legacy you think you'll leave behind? Brought it back to life. Brought it back to life. And you think you'll bring Winslow, help at least start bringing Winslow back to life, or have you? That would be wonderful. I think the building has. Um, definitely, given the town New Hope. Mm -hmm. And why not? How many little towns have anything like this? I mean, this town had this beautiful, this beautiful history and this beautiful building to illustrate that history. So, to have it brought back is fantastic. But the town has other things that are very interesting and wonderful too. This can be the cornerstone for all the other things, and if they're all brought back, well then there's a revival.